Um, my name is Marty Hart Landsberg. I'm an economist. And my talk's going to be about economics. And I listened carefully to most of your backgrounds and didn't hear a lot of economic background. <laughs> <laughs> but as an economist, I'm going to be giving you a lot of numbers. And the numbers are important, not that you have to remember them all, but that you can maybe see what I'm looking at when I make certain arguments about what's going on in Asia, um, what's the Asian relationship vis-a-vis -vis China, what's the US relationship vis-a-vis -vis Asia. These are, there are lots of important issues. And they're important issues for me. My own background, uh, besides being an economist, is I work a lot with the labor movement. And I work a lot with labor movements here, especially in South Korea, and a little bit um, through connections in Hong Kong with, with uh, labor movements in, in mainland China. So for me, a lot of this has to do with how does it affect working people, what's going on. So obviously, I think it's fair to say, obviously, Asia is the most dynamic center of capitalist accumulation in the world. According to the Asian Development Bank, developing Asia still account, continues to contribute 60% of world growth. Asia's key position is anchored by China. China, largely, according to Asian Development Bank, probably accounts for 40% of world growth. In fact, one commentator, this man named Stephen Roach, who's former chairman of Morgan Stanley Asia and now is the chief economist, estimates that China's contribution to global growth was 50% larger than the combined contributions of all the advanced capitalist economies. Asia's big. It was 60% of world growth, China 40% of world growth. This is pretty substantial. And China certainly looms large in terms of our thinking here about the US economy. More numbers. The US imports more from China than from any other country, about $500 billion a year. Canada and Mexico follow at only 300 billion. So China 500, Canada and Mexico 300 billion. The US runs the largest trade deficit in goods with China, about $400 billion. It's equal to about half of the entire US trade deficit in goods. Where the trade deficit, meaning uh, exports minus imports with China, is about 400 billion. In second place is Germany at only 75 billion. Mexico only 60 billion. And of course, China has very high profile because it's the main supplier of things like laptops, computers, cell phones. Maybe 80 or 90 percent in value terms, those products come from China. So Asia is an important global region. And China and Asian and US economic dynamics are, are very closely related. So in my talk, I'm going to try and answer three questions. And I'll tell you the three questions, and then I'll say something more about that. First, how did this happen? How did Asia become such a key center of global production? Second, what's the significance of Asia's growth for the people of Asia and the United States? And third, what lies ahead for majorities in Asia and the United States. So the first, how did it happen? How did Asia become such a key center of global production? And I would say that the rise of Asia, and particular, particularly China, to that center of global production is largely the result of the actions of transnational corporations. In particular, their strategy of creating Asian-centered cross-border production networks or global value chains. Here's how the Asian Development Bank de defines cross-border production networks or global value chains. You, you might hear those terms are used interchangeably. They involve dividing the production of goods and services into linked stages of production scattered across international borders. And the Asian Development Bank goes on to say, while such exchange of inputs is as old as trade itself, rapid growth in the extent and complexity of global value change since the 1980s is unprecedented. And here's a simple example of a global value chain or a cross-border production network. You actually have two. The making of a Barbie doll. The design of Barbie dolls, Mattel's headquarters in California. Oil comes from an oil exporting country to refineries in Taiwan. The nylon hair is made in Japan. The cotton clothing is made in China. 
The mold for the doll was made in the US, as was the paint and the box it's packaged in. The assembly of all these things takes place at factories in Indonesia and Malaysia, and quality testing takes place in China. We have a production process divided up, different parts in different countries brought together. Take the iPhone. Apple designs it. It gets uh, producers in the United States, heavily Japan, heavily South Korea, to produce different components. They go to China, where a company called Foxconn, which is Taiwanese, employs about a million Chinese who assemble the iPhone, and then it's sold. Things are, are divided. Now, the embrace of this strategy, which is not just trading, it's, it's actually reorienting production, owes a lot to capitalist competition, and more specifically, competition between US and Japanese corporations. Beginning in the 1970s, Japan began exporting more and more advanced goods to the United States. And this began taking market share from US companies and reducing their profits. And so the US began to get angry about this and started to push back at, at Japan. Look, you're, you're taking our markets. Your exports are growing. And we want you to do something. And they had all these different argue, ideas about what the Japanese should do. And the Japanese were resisting. But finally, in 1985, in the Plaza Hotel in New York, called the Plaza Accord, the Japanese said, OK, we'll try and end our huge export surplus to, to your country, US, by raising the value of our currency relative to the dollar. So if the yen gets more valuable, it means it takes more dollars to buy any yen, which means for American people, Japanese goods become more expensive. They'll buy less of them. For the Japanese, it means one yen will buy more dollars, so US goods should get cheaper. Japanese will buy more of them, and trade deficit will go away. That, that's what the Japanese said. And the Japanese basically pursued, followed over the next year, raised the value of their currency about 50%, which they knew was going to hurt their exporters. So they said to their exporters, we're going to help you globalize your production so that you're not going to be exporting so much from Japan. And initially, I mean, some of that came with a big movement of Japanese investment. When I say foreign direct investment, I mean investment in plant and equipment, real building stuff. That's when the Japanese started putting you know, car factories in the US, other things to escape this, this currency change. But they also began pumping billions of dollars into countries in Asia, especially Thailand, Malaysia, and Indonesia. They were going to go to South Korea, but 87 was a big democracy movement, lots of instability. There was also struggles in Taiwan, so they said, oh, not quite, so no, let's go to Thailand, Malaysia, Indonesia. And they poured billions of dollars in there and began to transform those countries from primary commodity exporters to exporters of manufactured goods. That was the end point where the manufactured goods came from. And to give you an example, by the end of 1980s, Foreign companies, mostly Japanese, accounted for 99% of the Malaysian, this is Malaysia, exports of electronics. Over 90% of the exports of machinery and electrical appliances. Over 80% of the export of rubber products. Over 75% of the exports of textile and apparel. By 1994, 8% of all Thai production workers worked for Japanese companies in Thailand. And of course, what the Japanese did is they would sell parts and components to Thailand, who might do a little refining and send it off to Malaysia, which would do more stuff, and then send it out. So the Japanese began creating these cross-border production networks, not giving up all their production, but giving up the, the labor parts of it, the labor-intensive and environmental-intensive parts to these other countries. And what happened, of course, is you have advanced Japanese technology, very cheap labor, so what did South Korea and Taiwanese companies think? Oh my gosh, we could compete against Japan with our cheaper labor and lower technology. But if you have advanced Japanese technology and lower labor costs, we're in trouble. So they began investing in plant and equipment in those countries as well. And it, it started to raise those countries. And you begin to get this sort of you know, Asia development spreading from Japan, Korea, Taiwan through, through these countries. As a result of all this, foreign direct investment was just exploding. And according to the UN, 
in the late 1980s, it became the engine of growth in the world economy. And by 1989, Japan was the largest provider of foreign direct investment in the world, providing about a quarter of it all. The United States used to be the major foreign direct investment. Now, now it was Japanese corporations. And I'm just going to we'll move to the side for this side point. This is the beginning <laughs> where Japan begins to have its stagnation. It, it didn't happen for another year or so because there was a, a bubble there. But Japanese investment, Japanese firms begin to leave Japan. And the stagnation that exists in Japan right now is because there's not much investment going on in Japan. They offshored most of their, most of their production. Well, when the Japanese began to do this, they escaped the high yen and they were being very successful. So what happened is gradually over time, US and then German leading transnational, multinational corporations began to do the same thing. They began to globalize. And this was really a significant development because as I've described cross-border production networks, where is most of the production taking place? In the third world, particularly Asia. Historically, foreign direct investment from an advanced capitalist country went to another advanced capitalist country. But now, it was going to the third world, particularly Asia. And in fact, by 2010, the third world was getting about 52, 54% of all the foreign direct investment going on. It began to shift things. Right? Now, as the Asian Development Bank quote I, I, I said earlier, this isn't just the same old globalization. So first, transnational corporations used to just have these export platforms. They'd send some things to a, you know, like the U.S. would send something to Mexico, you know, for garments or very simple electronics. They'd be assembled and they would come back to the U.S. and be sold. Now, what was happening is this process was being used to undertake far more advanced products. We're talking about automobiles, televisions, computers, cameras, cell phones, pharmaceuticals, semiconductors. But also, with this cross-border production networks, as you think about the iPod and things, the product wasn't coming back to the United States for final assembly and sell. It was being sold from China, right? Um, th these goods are now being struck, produced in, in, a, in, a, in a ton of places. And in fact, in many cases, the leading US companies like Apple, Dell, they don't even produce the goods themselves. They're having other companies produce under their direction. I'm going to come back to, to talk about that in a second. So this more sophistication, and more importantly, this cross-border production network, where production is now organized across many, many borders under the direction of transnational corporations for sale is something very different. When it really exploded, was when China began to open up to foreign direct investment. And that took place in the early to mid-1990s. And that finally anchored the creation of these cross-border production networks and really elevated the, the whole process. But let me say a word about, about China here. Um, when Mao died in 1976, the party began shortly after a major restructuring of the Chinese economy. In the 80s, they began marketizing. Still had a lot of state enterprises, but they began introducing markets. In the 1990s, they began privatizing state enterprises. And initially, the Chinese economy really took off with growth. And it's not surprising. People have often dismissed the Mao period as this economic failure. But the Mao era um, kind of bequeathed to the reformers a, a tremendous amount. China had no foreign debt had a well-developed, self-sufficient industrial base. It had no foreign capital invested there to distort things politically or economically. It had a relatively well-educated, well-disciplined workforce. So economy began to grow. But problems developed. One was in privatization, it came with unemployment. And Chinese workers didn't like unemployment. And it came with a reduction at the end of the Iron Rice Bowl, where People were guaranteed lifetime employment. And it also came with balance of payments problems. Now, before China had never, ex only had exported when it imported something, it was very self-sufficient. Now, with its growth, it started running trade deficits. So how do you solve that? 
How do you get companies to be more efficient? How do you get more jobs? How do you get more exports? Chinese said, we'll bring in foreign direct investment. And they'll discipline our firms to make them more efficient. They'll provide more jobs. They'll earn more revenue. And this dovetailed precisely with the period when foreign capital is looking to create these transporter, cross-border production networks. And so China started to become enmeshed in this transnational capitalist uh, process. And it wasn't long before China became then the premier location for everybody, Japanese, Korean, Taiwanese, instead of investing in, in Malaysia, Thailand, and Singapore, they began uh, uh, Indonesia moving to China, followed not long after by US capital, German capital, you know, other, other major capitals. And it was not long after China joined the WTO in 2001 that it really anchored this whole rise of Asia and through these cross-border networks. So then let me give you a couple of numbers to show you what I mean about how this process really changed. And, and my argument here is that trans, transnational corporations with their cross-border production networks is really anchoring, unifying a, an entire region around an export process. Okay? So developing Asia, what, what the UN refers to, is basically Asia minus Japan. Developing Asia share of total world exports of manufactured goods grew from about 11% in the mid-1990s to about 35% today. That means developing Asia has about a third of all the exports of manufactured goods, which is pretty significant. The Asian, developing Asia's share of all third world exports of manufacturers rose from about 60% in the mid-90s to about 85% today. China alone accounts for about 20% of world exports of manufacturers and 50% of all third world exports of manufacturers. But here's sort of the even more critical part to this. Because of this restructuring process, mo more and more of what East Asian, Southeast Asian countries export and import are parts and components. Like in the case of Barbies, the things here go into here, added together, going to here, added together. So what began to happen is the share of parts and components in developing Asia's total exports of manufacturers, exports rose from about 15% in the early 90s to 35% in the 2000s. So more than one third of all their exports of manufactured goods are now parts and components. On the import side, even more intense, it went from 29% to 44%. So since we're all friends here, say roughly half of all the imports that come into to, um, developing Asia are now parts and components. And more than half of all the trade within developing Asia is now parts and components. In other words, they're trading with each other. And compare that to NAFTA, which is only 36% of all of their NAFTA trade as parts and components, where the European Union 15 is only 22%. So you've got about 55% of all the trade within um, developing Asia is parts and components going from one country to another country. Now, as I mentioned, China was really the key. And here's what the Asian Development Bank says. The increasing importance of interregional trade is attributed mainly to the parts and components trade with China functioning as an assembly hub for final products in Asian production networks. So here's just an example of how China, so, so all these goods come to China where final assembly takes place and then export. And here's the pull that China has. Mel was mentioning how Asia looks to China. There's this economic relationship. This is a little complicated to say, but it's a simple statistic. This is the share of, ex, of manufactured exports from different countries I'm going to mention to China that are elect, elect, electronics products, parts and components and electronics. Okay. So the electronic share of manufacturing exports to China from Korea grew from 8% in 1995 to 32% by 2014. For Taiwan, it went from 9% to 63%. 
From Singapore, 17% to 40%. From the Philippines, 3.4% to 78%. So electronics is really key. It's our computers, it's our cell phones, it's you know, iPads, it's all these products. And all these countries are now, all their trade, they're all exporters and manufacturers. All of that's going, going to China. So one, one consequence then of this is that all these countries, as more of their economic activities, which they become more export oriented. So China, up until 2008, when we had the big crisis, according to a number of scholars, about 50% of China's growth was due to exports. And it was even higher for other countries, uh, for um, Korea, Taiwan, and Thailand, about 60% of growth was exports. For Malaysia, Singapore, and Vietnam, came, came higher, maybe even 65%. And so what was happening is these countries have been increasingly made export-oriented and increasingly had their economies focused on parts and components that were increasingly being traded in the region and then ending up in China and then being exported from China various advanced capitalist countries, and particularly the US, secondarily the European Union. And here's the last part that really sort of anchors this. I don't know if you know what correlation coefficients are, but they're ways of measuring how two variables move together. And so they either go from zero to one. If it's one, this moves, this moves. If it's zero, this moves, this doesn't move. So if these things are moving together, you get correlations that approach one. So the UN did some studies about, about this, and, and the numbers are quite revealing. The correlation between the growth in East Asian exports, they define East Asia as basically um, what we're calling developing Asia, and US non-oil imports was about 0.2 in the 1980s, 0.34 in the 90s, and 0.77 in the 2000s. What that means is whenever the US is importing something that's a, a product that isn't oil, originally East, East Asian exports, not too much. By the 90s, more. By the 2000s, almost 8.8, .8, meaning this goes up, this goes up. And even more staggering was the correlation between US importing of non-oil goods and trade within East Asia. Right? Because I'm arguing these production networks are tying together East Asia. And that correlation went from 0 0.01 in the 1980s. U.S. imports doesn't cause East Asian countries to trade goods because they're all producing their own goods. By the 90s, it was 0.2. And by the 2000s, it was 0.63. Take the case of Korea. Korean, about half of Korean GDP comes from exports to China. About 75% of them are parts and components that get put into production in China and exported to the US. So very critical, very important. And what does this say for, um, for the US? Um, you know, the Trump administration talks about China as if it's this giant state-run export machine that's destroying our economy. And it's important to sort of focus in a little bit on this because I'm arguing that transnational corporations are, are a critical part of this. Um, China's state is still very important, obviously. It owns the banking system. It owns a lot of natural resource-based uh, industries in, in terms of coal, oil, gas. But manufacturing and industrial production is now not state-owned. Private. Um, China, and by 2012, state owned enterprises accounted for only 24% of Chinese industrial output and 18% of urban employment. As for exports, in 2013, the share of state owned enterprises was only 11%. Transnational corporations were responsible for about 50% of all Chinese exports and about 80% of Chinese high technology exports. And the share of China's high technology exports produced by wholly owned foreign companies grew from 55% in 2002 to 68% in 2009, meaning that these foreign companies operating in China were becoming more and more in control of their own operations. 
And the second point to make is that a lot of the exports from China aren't really Chinese exports. Um, just to keep this short, when you, studies have been done on the, on the iPhone or the iPad, the only thing Chinese is the assembly process at the end. So when China exports an iPhone that costs about $275, China has imported all the components. The value it adds turns out to be about $10 per phone, the labor cost. Not even Chinese companies that are in charge of that. It's this, this Taiwanese company. So if you look at the US-China trade deficit, it looks huge because every iPhone of $275 is counted as part of the US deficit with China. But if you take out all the stuff that the Chinese have to import to produce those, the trade deficit gets cut in about half. So you've got um, essentially not so much Chinese state enterprises driving this, but you have US and, and non-US multinationals. In the US case, you've got you know, Apple, uh, Dell, Walmart, lots of different, lots of different companies. Um, let me just say a quick word about uh, um, how this, this transformation so you can see why Asia has, has risen to be, to be so important. As East Asia becomes the center of production, it needs a lot of raw materials. And so China starts to become the biggest consumer replacing the US of primary commodities, agriculture and, and, and non-agricultural goods, uh, major metals, agricultural commodities. China consumes about 20% of all non-renewable energy resources in the world, 23% of major agricultural crops, 40% of base metals. And who do they buy them from? Latin American countries, sub-Saharan African countries. And what's happened is, as East Asia rose to this position, it started purchasing from these countries and having its own multinationals, because remember, the Chinese state still dominates resource industries, going into these countries to help dig for, explore, own, you know, whether it's soy, whether it's oil, whether it's copper, tin, whatever. And the consequence has been that these countries in, in, in Latin America and Sub-Saharan Africa grew a lot because they were selling at really high prices their primary commodities. But where they had been diversifying their economies and developing more industries, not only was China now emphasizing these primary commodities, but China was selling its own manufactured goods to these countries, and it was weakening their own manufacturing base. But the UN was doing all these studies, and they were saying, my goodness, you know, uh, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa's manufacturing, which had been growing, is now shrinking. Latin America's manufacturing, which was growing, is now shrinking. Their manufactured exports are disappearing. They're, they're going backwards in terms, of their, uh, in terms of their economies. So in brief, Asia's rise owed much to a lot, confluence of forces. Competition, the need of transnational corporations to compete with each other, led by the Japanese, followed by the US, Korea, the Thai, others. And because of the well-developed infrastructures in Asia, and Japan, Japan is the leader, its closeness, and China, Asia became the center of this process. And it's had profound impacts on the economies uh, of the, those countries but also restructured things in, in the rest of the world. So let me stop for just a second here. And now I want to get to the consequences for people of, of these things. But this gives you a little feeling of, of understanding. Do you have any, any questions that I help answer? That... What does marketize, marketizing mean? So um, early on in, 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 under Mao, the Chinese would say, this is the price of this item. Prices weren't used for people making decisions. They were policy things. So they would say, we're setting food prices here. We're setting steel prices there. But then in the 80s, they said, let's let the supply and demand begin to affect prices. We still have state enterprises, but we'll allow supply and demand to, you know, we'll set limits. You know, the price can't go higher than this. It won't go lower than this. And then gradually they got away. So it was beginning to let the market predominate. What you're describing is very uh, closely associated or in my head, and maybe you can help differentiate, but the neoliberalism mm -hmm. and the focus globalized no, neoliberalism and those policies? Yes. Right or no? um, I mean, simple question. 
In, in biggest case, yes, because what was happening is these countries were opening themselves up to foreign investment, a lot of the free trade agreements became very important to regularize these things. But it's not an accident that Asia became such a center because they had very strong governments that could build infrastructure. Um, if you're gonna if you're gonna move your production there, you want good roads, ports, communication systems um, to make everything work. And so the fact that 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 these countries had strong states, so that's a little bit the other side of neoliberal because neoliberalism we envision, you know, like the U.S. that the state isn't very involved in a direct way. But I think it was, a, it was a combination of a kind of globalization which was tied in the developed country side to neoliberal, opening up freedom for corporations. But from the Asian side, what made Asia so attractive was the strong state capacities to create uh, disciplined labor forces, um, you know, good roads, good bridges, good power sources, um, those kinds of things. So. What about the social and longer term economic consequences? Again, focusing on Asia and the US. And here I'm going to just talk mostly about the period up to 2008, because after that crisis, globalization is a little bit more up for grab, you know, a sense of it's lost of some of its energy. So, first, maybe an obvious point, but this process of globalization, which started in the late 80s, into the 90s really hit, hit its full extent in the 2000s when China really opened up and became this premier location. That's why all the foreign investment goes to China. That's why China is the biggest market for every country in Asia, because they're selling all these parts and components to China. Um, this has been a real great thing for the developed capitalist country, transnational corporation. We'll talk a little bit about this right, so you can see why. How do transnational corporations control their production networks across borders? You could have them own every single unit, like in the Barbie case or the Popoff case. But that's not what's tended to happen. Because of these advanced goods, the transnational corporations that run these networks have the control because of the technology and the marketing and the advertising. So they hire, and, and it's usually under contract, other countries, other companies which increasingly are companies from the third world themselves, from Asia, to organize production for them under the direction of the lead transnational corporation. And so a lot of these the leading transnational corporations, they don't produce themselves anymore. Okay? And just to give you an idea how big this contract manufacturing has become, according to the UN, 90% of the production cost of all toys and sporting goods in the world is done by contract manufacturers for somebody else. 80% of all the production cost of consumer electronics, contract manufacturing. 70% of the production cost of auto components, contract. 40% of the production cost of generic pharmaceuticals, contracts. And because the cross-border production networks are set up for exporting, a very high share of all the exports of these items, toy, footwear, garments, electronics, are produced by contract manufacturers, like the iPhone, the iPad. Taiwanese company hired to organize all this under the direction of, of Apple. Now, why is this model so important? Well, if you're now the developed capitalist country, you no longer are employing your own workers in the developed capitalist world. Your labor costs have gone way down. And if you are not having to invest in the plant and equipment because you have this contract company doing it, you save a lot of money. So the question then is, what, what are companies doing with all these profits? You can see why it's very profitable for them to have done this. A lot of the risk. So when we read about how Foxconn in China is famous for workers uh, uh, throwing themselves off the top of their buildings, you know, at a period when about eight or nine, ten people were killed, their profit margins are so small, Foxconn's, because Apple negotiates with them, right? So all the costs of the labor, all the problems are, are not developed capitalist country, company problems anymore. So what, what are these companies doing with all this profit? They don't need to invest anymore 
In plant and equipment, that's not what they do anymore. They do research and development for sure, but they don't build the factories to produce these things. So it turns out they have been buying financial assets themselves. They have been buying back their own stock. You want to know why the stock market has been so great? It's mostly companies buying back their own stock. I mean, about 75% of the increase in stock market value comes from uh, uh, buybacks. The number of the, the shares in the stock market is actually declining because they're, they're, they're buying them back. And they're paying huge dividends. And they're buying other companies. About, they're, they're actually pumping money to their stockholders through dividends and share buybacks and things like that, equal to about 5% of GDP. We're talking about a trillion dollars a year. Their investment is extremely low. That's true in the US, it's true in, in Japan, and it's true in, in Germany. And what does this mean for jobs? Here I'm just gonna um, you know, sim simplify this. But in the 80s, job creation in the US was such that higher skilled jobs grew the fastest, middle skilled jobs the next, low skilled jobs the lowest. In the 90s, it was high skilled jobs the most, middle skilled jobs disappeared, and low skilled jobs kind of grew. In the 2000s, it's been high skilled jobs have basically leveled off, middle skilled jobs have been like that, flat, and low skilled jobs have exploded. So what we've seen here, as one, one, um, one of the leading uh, labor economists, David Otter, writes, stated plainly the U-shaped growth of occupational employment, U-shaped meaning in the 90s when you had a lot of folks at high skill and low skill but nothing in the middle, has now come to resemble a downward ramp in the 2000s. It's, it's low skill jobs. And as a consequence, you can see studies have been done. They're very creative studies. And I, I don't have time to go into it all unless you really have the same interest as me. Um, and knowing how all these studies take place. But these economists have looked at how much Chinese exports from China of manufacturers have, have cost manufacturing jobs in the US. And they found that from 2000, from 1990 to 2007, about a third of all the job loss in manufacturers in the US came from the increase in exports of manufacturers from China. And that as those people were released from jobs, they flooded into other sectors of the economy and ended up driving down the wages in the other sectors of the economy. And, th and of course, I'm just looking at the Asian share. We know that there are cross-border production networks that go to Mexico, Central America. So this wave of activity really decimated uh, jobs and has produced an economy that um, where growth has been slow, there hasn't been a lot of investment, real income has fallen, the corporate profits have really soared. And it's also led, in many cases, to precarious work. And Japan has gone further in this than, than the other developed capitalist countries. In Japan, part-time workers make about an average 38% less per hour than full-time workers. And part-time workers now account for 40% of the workforce. In fact, over the last five years, temporary and part-time workers account for all the nation's job growth. So part of the consequences of this has been um, very big. Um, and even from 2001, 2007, when globalization was really soaring, average income in the United States was falling. What about Asia? Here, real changes. Real wealth has been created, but there's been real costs paid by working people. So like the US, you can say, well, we have a dynamic economy, and we have lots of fortunes being created. But the average worker is struggling. And it's been a little bit the same story in Asia. First, just one thing, environment. Um, the, the World Health Organization reported that outdoor air pollution contributed to 1.2 million premature deaths in China, counting for almost 40% of the global total. More than 70% of China's lakes and rivers are polluted. Almost 40% of those considered, almost 40% of those are considered seriously polluted. Some 100,000 people die each year from water pollution related illnesses. 100 million people a year are sickened from bacterial foodborne diseases caused by 
lack of regulation and contaminated agricultural land. Close to 70% of China's farmland is considered contaminated with toxic chemicals. If you look at this at job creation in China, this is sort of a shocking figure, but the Bureau of Labor Statistics in the US found that total manufacturing employment in China fell by 7 million during the period 1994 to 2006. And part of that is because when foreign capital came in, they're much more intense. It's not like the old Chinese state industries where you had a lot of people on, you didn't push production that hard. Now it's more capital intensive, more global, more <coughs> export oriented. And so the actual number of manufacturing workers fell. Um, about 80% of all manufacturing workers, 90% of all construction workers in China are internal migrants. And I'm not sure how much you know about the Chinese system, but they have a household registration system. So when those people move to the urban areas where the new jobs are and the construction are, they have a household registration system that's not in those urban areas, which means they have no access to any of the public provided services in those cities, uh, free or, or subsidized health care, uh, housing, uh, even some of the employment compensation things. And even if they have children while living in those urban areas, those children don't have access to those either. Uh, the way pension laws are set up, they often can't, can't claim any pension. Go ahead. Yeah, so this is, they said, I heard about that they sometimes have a daughter that they don't register so that daughter doesn't exist. So those are the times they have people who are moving to the cities too because they don't have any national identity. Right. Mm -hmm. But even, you know, now they're making it a little bit easier to, for people to live. At one time you had to pay a lot of money to kind of illegally get in. Now you can. But if you have a child and you want to send them to public school, you can't send them to public school. You have to pay for private schools because you're not an urban resident. And one of, the, one of the problems with Chinese labor statistics is a lot of times when they look at wage growth and thing, they look at what's called the regular urban workers, or the, or the unemployment statistics are for regular urban workers, or even population figures are for regular urban residents. And you have a lot of the key cities where maybe half the population are these, are these, are these immigrants. This is just an example of a company, Taiwanese factory producing chips and motherboards for Dell computers. Found um, these are mostly migrant workers. That um, employees commonly put in work weeks of over 60 hours, regularly exceeding the legal overtime limit of 36 hours a month. Many times they were forced. I'm quoting from their study: forced to work seven times, seven straight days. Most had to stand for their entire 12-hour shifts, suffering from extreme temperatures and toxic fumes. China has also it passed a labor code to try and improve things on paper. At least the central government did. But the interpretation is it doesn't count for um, interns, student interns, or dispatch uh, labor, or temporary workers. And what happens then is these labor industries set up in the provinces. They say, oh, we're going to, you know, you go to a, 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 a school to learn. Well, part of that is you have, to, you have to work as a student for a year or two. And they bring them in, and they don't have to pay any of the standard, um, standard benefits and things. Um, Chinese workers have suffered and Oh, you know, not to say there's been no gains at all, um, but the, the working conditions are, are, are very intense. But a lot of wealth has been created. China now has the most, has the greatest wealth inequality in all of Asia. And according to UN statistics, uh, World Bank statistics, there are only two large countries in the world that have greater inequality, and that's South Africa and Brazil. China used to have, of course, one of the most equal um, societies. And because China is the core center and it gets all the foreign investment, if you look at the data, foreign investment just doesn't come that much to Korea or to Taiwan or to um, Malaysia or any place anymore. It goes mostly to China. So these governments have to try and attract that foreign investment. And in the case of Korea, keep their own large companies from leaving to China. And so they have been introducing labor law reforms that make things worse for their workers. So Korea is a good example of this. The previous two presidents um, basically arrested labor law, uh, labor leaders, banned some public sector unions, passed laws, which now are, are, they're encouraging where the large companies can lower the wages of older workers 
and hired young workers under sub-minimum wages and all these kinds of things that we're a little bit aware of here in the United States. But, but why are they doing that? Partly because they're trying to compete against labor conditions in China. Um, and so you get, you know, in South Korea now, where it used to be the top 10% of earners made about 29% of all the income, now it's about 50% of all the income. Great inequality growing in China. Um, I mean, excuse me, Korea, Korea was, was a country. Okay, the last thing to say about evaluating this globalization process is that it wasn't stable. So great wealth for people at the top. U.S. workers paid a price. German workers have paid a price. Japanese workers may have paid the greatest price. Um, Asian workers, huge transformation in Asia, significant wealth gains, not just at the top, but significant number. But for a lot of Asian workers, um, it's been a very heavy price to pay. But what, what was the contradiction in this process? Why, why do transnational corporations do this? Well, they, it was an export-led model. And the more they invest to produce, the more they have to export. Well, where are they exporting? The United States. But the contradiction is that the process did what? It undermined the purchasing power of US consumers. Why? For all the job loss I mentioned, the, de the declining income, the lack of investment. So at the very time you're building a model that requires more and more exports, the process of building that model is undercutting the consumption base of the people who are supposed to buy the goods. Well, why didn't we see that in the 2000s? Well, we all remember the debt bubbles. Average income 2000s for working people went down. People were able, because of the rise in house prices, to refinance their house. People were essentially about three and a half trillion dollars a year were being refinanced. People were refinancing their houses to spend money. Debt for disposable income hit records. And that's what sustained it. And so the US ran huge trade deficits, the other side of huge Asian surpluses. One of the reasons why China looms so large is because where countries like Korea and Taiwan used to export directly to us, like Taiwan used to export laptops to us. Taiwan shifted all of its laptop production to China. So China looms so large to us because it's the face of this whole Asian export center. But what happened when the crisis hit here and the housing bubble collapsed, then boom, down goes the economy, suddenly globalization um, is in serious problem. And nobody can replace the US. US consumption is about maybe $11 billion, excuse me, $11 trillion a year, household consumption. In Japan, it's about two and a half trillion. In Germany, it's less. And both Germany and Japan want to be export countries. They don't want to be importing. US consumers in the 2000s probably accounted for about a third of global growth because of their purchases. And when that went away with the, with the collapse of housing and the big recession, boom, suddenly exports fell. The world economy went into a big recession. For the first time now, world trade is growing more slow. At the first time in 15 years, world trade is growing, growing more slowly than world GDP. World trade grew by about 1.7% in 2016. It used to grow at about 6 or 7% a year. And so as you can imagine, if you've got a permanent slowdown, because the US is, is in a permanently different place, I, I think, then this whole structure of exports is now what, what's going to happen to Asia. I'm going to stop here for a second. Mm. Consequences, I would say, it's a complex picture. It's not to say that there weren't real wealth created, real investment, but we often tended to equate exports and foreign investment with an improvement in working people's lives. And there's nothing automatic about that. You can see you know, in China and Korea and places like that, and even in the US, where real standards of living have, have, have gone down, even though we have greater you know, consumption possibilities and technological developments. So any questions on, on this part? Yeah. OK, so if, for example, we boycott a certain Close because mm -hmm. we hear about factories in Cambodia have horrible conditions. 
is that a, is it an effective means to create change mm -hmm. or does the idea of um, these new contracts where you just where corporations contract out with a, with a factory does that mean that boycotts have less effect than they used to well it requires a lot more connection like for example um, Nike um, since Nike here in, in the Portland area, there's been a lot of work on this. I work a lot with labor. So what happens is they contract out for shoes and clothing in, say, El Salvador or Honduras, other companies. And those companies, when workers try and unionize them, they close down, open up with a new name you know, down the road. Those workers have now been coming to the United States and talking to the US labor movement and saying, we need your help in putting pressure on Nike. Or student groups you know, have been at a lot of schools trying to create a, it's not the Fair Trade Association, but it's something else, it's called the Fair Trade Association is what the companies created, but the students have a different one. And part of their demands are that companies will have to allow and promote subcontractor company, contracted companies to allow unions and, and accept it. So I think what it requires is, is closer working relations between labor movements. Oh, okay. And that's beginning to happen now because um, workers, you know, in, in the US for, for many years, it was like we produced all the manufacturing goods and, you know, we bought the resources and who cared, you know, what was going on now. But this globalization has, you know, is pitting workers together. And, and sort of hitting U.S. workers hard. And U.S. workers are now realizing that they, they have to figure out what's going on abroad and, and can we help each other. And so you're actually starting to get associations of all the workers who work under the contracts association for a whole production network trying to meet and talk. So I think what, what hasn't worked well are corporate codes of conduct because the... Um, because the monitoring isn't very serious. But what has worked well is when consumer groups make direct contact with workers in these other companies and use the workers as monitors and the workers' demands as the demands they make to the company. So it's a little more sophisticated in that sense. You can't just say improve conditions, but you have to say and recognize the union. And if there is a union, not just leave that contractor and go to another one. So these are, these are the kinds of things, and that requires a lot more exposure and a lot more um, connection, and, and it's hard. Um, but I think the, you know, the, the intensity of the problems are sort of producing more conversations and, and more discussions. So let me do the last part here, and then just the remaining time we can just sort of talk about this. So what lies ahead? Um, first, export growth has really tumbled as I, as I mentioned, and not surprising, after the, the two, after the global downturn ends. 2009, we're, we're supposedly out of the end of the Great Recession. Lots of people aren't quite sure, but technically, according to economists, it's all over. And so what happened? Well, Chinese growth rates went from 35% in 2006 down to 9% in 2008 and minus 10% in 2009. The Chinese growth fell. In other parts of Asia, it was delayed. It was delayed, in, say, till 2010. And then you had, like, Korea and Taiwanese growth rates fell from, like, 30% down to 2%. Uh, 2015 and 2016, Asian export growth rates were about zero. Uh, 2016, uh, China's export fell, like, 7%. Things have been much worse for Sub-Saharan Africa and Latin America because they their exports, their primary commodities, fell in price so dramatically that they have just been devastated, and many of those countries are in recession. But Asia is not in a recession. China is not in a recession. So how do we, how do we explain that? And the answer is really um, Chinese state. And my argument, I want to tell you what the, what, how I understand what the Chinese state has done and why I think it's, it's a short-term problem and we have big difficulties ahead and big challenges ahead. So the Chinese state responded to, remember exports were so key, and they responded to the big decline 
not by raising the wages really of Chinese workers, but by launching a huge infrastructure investment campaign to build roads, towns, apartment complexes, shopping malls, high-speed rail lines, airports. And they flooded the country with money to make it cheap to borrow, for companies to expand, to produce the steel and concrete and everything that was needed. And the investment share of Chinese GDP went from about 35% in 2007, which is large. The US is only about 20%, to about 50% in 2012. Un un unheard of levels of, of fixed investment. From 2006 to 2015, China has spent about $11 trillion building roads, airports, ports, railways. Just a huge amount of money. Trump talks about a trillion dollar, but it's not even real. I mean, this is it's real. And why didn't China just sort of raise wages? Well, because a lot of China's production capacity is export oriented by foreign companies who don't want higher wages. And already some of the, some of the most labor intensive companies are leaving to go to Vietnam or, or some of the other cheaper company, countries. And the Chinese say, even if we raise wages or our workers, they're not going to buy all the iPods and, and Dell laptops. They don't, they don't have the money. So it's kind of a holding action. But what's happening is that there's a question of whether this is sustainable, because it has to be a long-term strategy. If you're not going to have a re resurgence of US imports, where are all the purchases going to come from? And so here's what's some of happened. I'm going to read you these quotes so you can really get a feeling. Here's Financial Times. Ghost cities lined with empty apartment blocks, abandoned highways, and mothballed steel mills sprawl across China's landscape. The outcome of government stimulus measures and hyperactive construction that have generated 6.8 trillion in wasted investment since 2009. There's Bloomberg Business Week. For all the roads, bridges, and highways that China builds every year in an effort to keep the economy humming, the massive splurge may not have the desired effect. That's because more than half of China's infrastructure investment has destroyed economic value instead of creating it. The evidence suggests that over half of the infrastructure investment in China is made in the last three decades. The costs are larger than the benefits they generate. What's more, unless China shifts its focus to fewer and higher quality types of public works to have a positive legacy, the country is headed for an infrastructure-led national financial and economic crisis, which is likely also to be a crisis for the international economy. So what's happened is China's massive infrastructure has kept the other Asian countries up, selling parts components, but their growth has slowed because it doesn't need the same amount. But all of this growth in infrastructure doesn't generate the same employment. It's very capital intensive. And it's created environmental problems, ghost towns, um, and also excess capacity of companies and also because interest rates are very low, housing bubbles. And despite all this, Chinese growth has been falling every year, from over 10%, down to 9%, to 8%, to 7%, to 6.9%. Last year, 6.7%. China's saying, well, we can hold this at 6.5%. Many commentators who look at the data say they may be down by 5% already. So this is the challenge. This is not a sustainable process for China. And if they back off on infrastructure, the economy is going to, I'm not saying it's going to collapse, but it's going to go into a significant slowdown. And that's going to reverberate back into the rest of Asia, um, which has built up these export um, bases. And it's going to push some of those Asian countries into, into recession. And of course, reverberate. Now, China. You know, is big. The U.S. is probably the only country who could create a world crisis on its own. But what that means is it's going to be pushing growth rates down, growth rates down everywhere. And so I think the the uh, workers in Asia face a big challenge. And in many ways, it's like our challenge. Um, you know, what do we do? The Chinese elite is very committed to their strategy. You can't believe, or maybe you can how rich the Chinese elite are. I'm going to read you this one quote because it was kind of staggering to me. This was a Bloomberg News report. And they, the net worth of the 70 richest delegates in China's National People's Congress was 89.8 billion. 
Now, I'm going to put this in perspective. The total net worth of all 660 top officials in the three branches of the U.S. government is $7.5 billion. <laughs> I'm going to do that again. The <laughs> 70 <laughs> richest delegates in China's National People's Congress was $89.8 billion. U.S., all 660 top officials, $7.5 billion. Now, that's why inequality is, is so great. There's a lot of wealth. And the question is, are they willing to abandon what they have? Well, is the US elite willing to abandon what it has and say, yeah, let's raise minimum wages. Yeah, let's, let's you know, regulate to get an economy. Let's roll in a little bit this free. No, they're not. They're willing to sort of take the costs and see what happens, figuring they'll ride it through. And that's the situation we're in. And yes, there are dangers that as this thing happens, workers will see, you know, Trump says it's Mexican workers, it's Chinese workers. Well, US workers believe that. What I'm really arguing is that workers in all those countries are facing somewhat similar challenges and, and somewhat similar opponents, which is these leading transnational corporations and their national allies who, who, who share in that wealth. And so the question is, you know, do we see Asia as some success story that other countries can follow? Not likely. Asia's already filled in this gap of exports and it relied on transnational corporations that aren't going to these other countries. And it's not sustainable. And it's not been as successful for the average Asian worker as it may seem sitting on this end when we think that they're taking all of our jobs and all, all of our wealth. And is China going to anchor some alternative, stable world system to replace us? Because we see them exporting all these goods. Well, no. All of Asia's become, yes, very powerful, and everybody trades with China, but China's exporting growth that depends a lot on exporting to us. And so indirectly, everybody is still dependent on, on these exports. And now we see the problems in the US economy, some of which were caused by the globalization problem, which means companies no longer need to invest to make and they pit workers against each other. So the question now for us as working people really is, how do we come to grips with this? Who do we see as our friends? Who do we see as our enemies? How do we build movements that can make more domestically centered, sustainable patterns of production? And if we can begin to see that, see ways in which gains in one place can support gains in the other, and we begin to kind of work together to, to build a different global economy. I just have a question in regards to international finance currency exchange, mm -hmm. in regards to China having a lot of um, invested interest in the US dollar mm -hmm. and buying of that. And I'm curious, as an economist, your insight into that. Yeah, and I think it's a very important point. Um, this is why, I mean, I think there's a, there's a great interdependence between China and the US. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, US companies buying things, but also the point you made. When China was really exporting like crazy and attracting all this foreign investment, they were getting all these dollars. And what China didn't want to have happen, if all this money flows into a country, when you eventually it has to exchange into the local currency. So if all these dollars would flow in, it would raise the value of the Chinese currency and start to make Chinese goods more expensive. So if China takes all the dollars it gets, and invest them back in the United States, it keeps the Chinese currency relatively low and smooth. Is that what's happening? So that's what hap what's happened over the last 10 to 15 years, that China was essentially recycling the money back. Because if all the dollars are come in and they stay here, but if they go back out, it keeps things. So the Chinese have trillions of dollars in US securities. And, and they care about what happens to your interest rates and US monetary policy. What's interesting is that the last two and a half years, wealthy Chinese are pulling their money out of China. And China is now seeing a huge run on their reserves. And like, like Mel, I don't have insider information on the big banks. <laughs> but the business press is saying, that this appears to be a sign that the Chinese elite themselves are losing confidence that the Chinese government can somehow sustain 
you know, these, these high rates of growth and these profitable situations. And so there's a fear that if things really get bad, there could be, you know, from the Chinese point, a huge run on currency, which would certainly drive the currency way down, create all sorts of difficulties in the, in the foreign exchange markets. But the core of your question is, it was a policy that both sides kind of thought was good, because when the Chinese put all the money back in the United States, what did that do? It meant the US government could borrow money at a very cheap interest rate and finance its deficits, and companies could borrow very cheap. They liked it. It meant that Chinese goods stayed very cheap. And since US companies were importing them, it meant that Walmarts and everybody could sell very nice. And for the Chinese, it meant they built up a war chest, a little leverage over the US, and they kept their currency flat. And the current affair is a state of affairs. Like, if this isn't happening, or if it's now being even more dramatic. Well, I mean, I think this is where we really have a, a situation where we, we don't have a stable international economic system. Yeah, right, 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 right. And I mean, the free trade agreements provide some infrastructure. But, um, and that's why they're considered so important. And as we negotiate them now, you know, Trump may say all sorts of things, but we already see that what was going to be on throwing out NAFTA is now we're going to modernize and we're going to take um, new areas like um, services industry is big in for the US now. And so they want to be able to take all the data when they're selling customers and bring the data back to the US and, and finance and things. So, so you know, government may say things, but the real interests, uh, corporate interests underneath are very powerful. But the question is, as those corporate interests keep going, it's a little bit like 2007, 2008. I mean, there are people who can look at it and say, this doesn't look very stable. And yet, as long as money's being made, people aren't going to, don't back away from it. Now, we're not right at the verge of that same crisis, but, you know, we're due for a recession soon. And, we haven't rebuilt our savings. We haven't, you know, polished off a wonderful healthcare system. We haven't modernized it. What happens when we have our recession? And then what happens to all these countries whose whole infrastructure has been based on exporting? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, in Korea, you have these movements. What do we do with these large companies who are going to Vietnam and cruise cell phones elsewhere? And, and so what it really, going back to your question, it really says that now more than ever, labor movements have to be talking to each other. And, and that's a big challenge to, to break some of the nationalism that countries use to kind of steer people's attention different ways. Uh, I just wanted to uh, underscore some one of um, Marty's themes so that make sure it doesn't get lost uh, related to China. Um, you know, we're in a time when all the talk is uh, in this country about the China challenge, right? Mm -hmm. Used and, um, uh, and there's a tendency to do what do about China what was once done about the Soviet Union, which was to make it into some behemoth mm -hmm. that was on the move that could, could do no wrong, right? Everything just gobbling up resources, uh, um, posing a tremendous challenge to uh, American hegemony everywhere, and so on. But but what I want to uh, to emphasize is that he's. Marty has provided a lot of statistics and other information which indicate that and the Chinese know this, the Chinese leadership knows this best of all, uh, that there are lots of, of sources of weakness uh, in China, uh, many of which relate in turn to social instability. You know, uh, whether, it has to, whether the sources are uh, employment and urban, uh, particularly urban areas, way in which the countryside is being abandoned and therefore issues of food supply, environmental disruption is an enormous uh, issue, uh, including the fact that the Chinese have not abandoned coal, contrary to what has now become an uh, accepted uh, belief that uh, they're now all, they're all um, into hydro and sunshine uh, energy solar. Um, so that there, in short, um, there are a lot of, of, of weaknesses within and society and the economy, and uh, those, you know, if you're if you're at the head of a gigantic party organization, uh, and after all, the Chinese system is a party state, you, know, uh, you are quite worried 
at the present and, uh, and future. So we shouldn't we shouldn't lose track of that. Yeah, it's very important. I'm glad you emphasized it. And one of the areas that doesn't get a lot of attention in the U.S. is that the Chinese labor movement, I think they're second to South Africa in the number of strikes per capita. Um, because there was a period, you know, when in 2008 the Chinese said, well, we're, we're going to raise wages, we're going to put in a new labor, um, new labor law that provided that every worker has to have a labor contract and there has to be certain movement to full-time work. And then when the crisis really deepened, they kind of withdrew that uh, and, and said, well, we're gonna you know, suppress certain, these things. And so what you have are um, workers who are responding with now um, a massive strike, strikes breaking out all the time that are mostly export-oriented industries. And so there's a question of you know, will industries keep coming? What happens to China if they can't keep getting the investment? If we actually yield on these things, what happens? And so even though, like so often, the governments say, you know, we're, we're handling the environment and we go forward, they say, well, you know, we're going to make a harmonious society and we're going to, you know, raise everyone's wages. Well, not if it jeopardizes the, the, the growth model. And so you've got China now cracking down on non-governmental organizations that were Chinese organizations that took a little foreign funding to help um, you know, uh, support workers' safety. Um, because Chinese unions are all state unions, they're often paralyzed about what to do. They don't see their role as necessarily defending workers. So as workers are doing things, all these independent organizations develop to support them. And the Chinese have now arrested um, you know, several of the leaders. They've closed down on organizations. They're trying. Know, to, to dampen down on strikes, but some of the, the you know the, the groups in Hong Kong that report on these things, you know, are really sh you know showing. When I used to go into Hong Kong, to some of the factories, early on, um, a lot of the Hong Kong people would use me as the as the excuse, and they would say, "Here's just a professor wanting to know about the economy." And then secretly they talked to him about building democratic unions. And then you know <laughs> recently you know I would go in, and they would push me away. I was knowing you know I was I got the visa, and then I say. Let's talk about union. Well, how are you building your union, right? And there's, you know, I, I'm not sure. I think the unions and the, the workers themselves are unclear about what ways to go, because they hear their government say they're socialist, and they hear people from Western countries say that they're the enemy, and there's a lot of confusion about what what's what. But there, there's a, there's a lot of militancy and a lot of. Uh, maybe because of history, a sense of pride and, and capacity, and that's another part of the in instability, and also something that we can look to and maybe you know build with and learn from. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.